Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History, the best source on the internet for the history of the Eastern Roman Empire. All of our information is based on primary sources and scholarship from leading historians. I am your host, Daniel Maynard. As I have done the second game, Medieval Total War 2, I felt I should do the first. Now the game Medieval Total War is split into an early, middle and late period. The early period is set in AD 1087, just after the death of William the Conqueror, during the reign of Alexios I Comnenus. The high period is set in 1205, a year after the sack of Constantinople. The faction leader is Constantine Lascaris, who is numbered the 11th in this game. Though it could easily be confused with Constantine Palaiologus, Constantine was never actually emperor, but he was de facto leader of the Nicene Empire while Theodore Lascaris was still establishing himself. This was in a period from 1204 to 1205. I appreciate that a bit more effort was put into getting the right man to fit the date, unlike the second game, but I could see many people, including myself, being confused by this. The late period is set in 1321, during the reign of Andronicus II Palaiologus. The faction background for the early period says, The Byzantine Empire is the child of the Roman Empire, or rather the Greek-speaking eastern half of the Roman Empire. This is pretty much spot on. It has always been a power in the world, ruled by despots and assassins, fools and wise men, poets and generals, all combining religious and political authority in one man. That it has survived and even prospered is a tribute to its underlying strength and the luck of the empire's position at the crossroads of the world. The Romans, uniquely compared to Western Europe, did see all sorts of people become emperor. Peasants, admirals, women, intellectuals, whereas, taking England for instance, we have had no king that was not connected to the royal line from William I to our current monarch. It is an overstatement to say that the emperor had all religious authority. This was invested in the patriarch of Constantinople, who could be deposed or appointed by the emperor, but ultimately it was down to the Patriarch to call synods and make adjustments to religious doctrine, not the Emperor. The rest of the statement is fine. Almost no trade moves east or west without making Byzantium richer and filling the Emperor's coffers with taxes. This wealth and the heavy tolls needed to sustain the Imperial Court can be a cause of envy and resentment from other peoples. The Eastern Roman Empire was a major trade hub. It is no surprise that the Venetians and Genoese and other Italian merchant republics wanted to get a quarter for themselves at this highway between East and West. It was also one of the leading traders of silk in Europe for centuries. Constantinople, or Byzantium, was founded as the second Rome by Constantine the Great and is the greatest city in Europe, and maybe the greatest in the world. Its walls are impregnable, its army is fearsome, its people impossibly wealthy and cultured. The bits about the city are true. The army was a force to be reckoned with, but it had its fair share of disasters. This was why diplomacy was such an important factor, since the Roman army was prone to fail when they needed it least. Although the empire was starkly wealthy compared to Europe, and other areas, it took a very long time for it to regain the splendour it had in classical times. It was not until the Isaurian and Macedonian dynasties that the state became wealthy and cultured enough to the extent that creative assembly is talking about here. Byzantine coinage effortlessly dominates the world trade and can be used to buy goods the world over. In matters of religion, Byzantine patriarchs are unwilling to recognise the papacy's claim to superior status, as the schism between the Orthodox and Catholic halves of Christianity goes unhealed. 
a pretty accurate appraisal. However, by 1087, the economic situation of the Eastern Roman Empire was in dire straits, with the Nomismata containing barely 10% gold from the 95% it had been at the beginning of the century. The Great Schism of 1056 would not be healed until the 20th century. Byzantium, however, does face problems. Within those problems could be opportunities for further greatness. The Empire has had a measure of security thanks to the skill of its mercenary armies, and has held on to many of its ancient frontiers, even in the face of Islamic expansion. It is true that Anatolia was held, and some possessions that were lost were taken back, such as Crete and Cyprus. However, Sicily had been totally lost to the Arabs and Normans by this point. It perhaps is an overstatement to say that they held many of their ancient frontiers in the face of Islamic invasion, considering two-thirds of the empire was lost during the initial Islamic conquests in the 7th century. Now while the troops remain as good as ever, a new threat has arisen in the east. This statement is not particularly true in 1087. The Roman Empire's army was a shambles according to Scylitzes and Italiates by this point. The mercenary bands were also more trouble than they were worth, as they were often very poorly disciplined and difficult to control. It was not until the reign of Alexios Comnenus, which started six years earlier in this date, that the military was starting to shape up into the formidable force it would be in the coming centuries. A good emperor will need to concentrate much of his military might, including the fearsome Catrafratoi, against the emerging threat of the Seljuk Turks. At the same time, he must also be aware of the other opportunities, the Balkans, the Holy Land, and North Africa. A maritime strategy controlling the Mediterranean can pay dividends. Finding common cause with one of the Catholic princes of the West is also, for example, a viable strategy, as neither side will necessarily want to eventually conquer the same territory. This is quite interesting, as it reflects the conquest and diplomatic strategy of the Komnemnoi, who ruled the empire at this time. Alexios I, John, and Manuel attempted extending Byzantine influence over these areas and beyond. An emperor who can harness the power of the Western Crusaders can also profit from their work in weakening his enemies. This is something that the Romans certainly did benefit from, especially the First Crusade that saw cities such as Nicaea restored to their control, thanks to the Crusaders' expedition. Having finished the background, we will now look at the map. The map for the Roman territories is odd. It reflects the Empire of 1025, not 1087. By 1087, Italy was completely lost as well as most of Anatolia, but in this they own all of southern Italy and Anatolia. They also never owned Georgia in this period. Apart from that, the Romans have been given all of the correct territories they should have, such as Bulgaria, Crete, and so on. I hope you found this enjoyable, and we'll see you next time.